is innovation and education something that is the responsibility of your administrators or is it of the school as a whole? Is this something that teachers can do not only in their classroom, but we hold each other accountable? I'm going to talk about this today in this episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. It's George Crows here and I'm just doing a solo episode. I've tried to commit to actually doing at least one of these a month, just kind of just talking, sharing some ideas, maybe uh, revisiting some of my old articles and putting them into a bit of a current context. And I've really been thinking a lot about innovation education, why it matters so much. And it's obviously something I've been focusing on for years, but especially now in education, when we look at innovation, when we look at what we do in the profession, are we continuously getting better at our work that we do? And innovation, a lot of people think it's synonymous with the idea of utilizing technology. And I can tell you right away, uh, sometimes technology can make things worse. And I'll give you an example, Scantrons. Uh, when I was a high school teacher, I'll be the first one to tell myself, we got a Scantron in our high school. And as soon as we got that Scantron, boom, everything went to multiple choice in my classroom because I hated marking so much. And really when I was marking early in my career, I was marking to give a grade not to help students get better. And I think there's a really big difference between, you know, grading and assessment. And assessment is should lead to better learning, whereas grading is just kind of plopping a mark onto a paper sometimes. And I, I understand there's elements of that where that's reality in our world, but the ultimate work assessment is not only to, to help people um, kind of understand where they're at, but where they can go and think about that way. And so that technology, when I was using that Scantron, it was constantly, you know, pushing myself uh, to do multiple choice tests, which wasn't really promoting deep thinking. It was promoting like, you know, fill in a bubble. Now, obviously you had to get the answers right, things like that. There's some elements of knowledge that have to go through that process, but that made my life so much easier, but did it make the learning better? And, and so when we talk about innovation, don't equate it to technology. Of course, technology can be a part of it, but how does it actually improve learning? How does it improve the work that we do in education? And so I've been thinking about this and there are tremendously innovative educators. And that's not what I wanna talk about today because I think what we see a lot in our schools is this idea where we have these pockets where you go into one classroom, they're doing some really innovative things. They're always trying to help every learner as best as possible. And then maybe across the hallway, the experience is not as good. And it doesn't mean the teacher's bad, doesn't mean that the teacher's weak, but how do we actually improve each other across the hallway, not, you know, dread, you know, kids could be in this class or this class, or, you know, like everywhere we go, there's tremendous opportunity for our students and for the adults as well. And when we talk about this, we often see this as an admin problem, right? Like, am I really responsible for the teacher across the hallway? And I would say, yeah, you are. We all are. We're accountable to one another because every single person listening to this podcast, taking their own time, listening to an education podcast wants, you know, to have the best opportunity for every kid in our schools, not just the kids in our classrooms. And so how do we hold each other accountable? How do we, I guess, don't, not just hold each other accountable, but help one another. I think that is more important because we accountability is one thing, but not without the support, not without the, the need to help one another. So when I look at this article, uh, I wrote, uh, the title of it is Four Ways to Lead and Create a Culture of Innovation from any position. And so the first point that I share is that, I've kind of been touching on this, is that we need to be accountable to each other, not just administrators. And (laughs) this is something that I've talked about a lot, and it really bothers me, is this idea that you can't be a prophet in your own land. And my question is, why not? Why can't you be? And many of you listening probably do some really innovative things and do some incredible things in your schools and your classrooms. And if we're being honest, you probably felt ostracized by your colleagues sometimes that you felt, you know, maybe you got some little backhanded compliments, uh, some things said to you because you were doing incredible things, right? 
And sometimes I've actually had teachers come up to me and say like, hey, I've been doing some of this stuff, but I think it's making some of my colleagues feel uncomfortable and it's not necessarily the best situation. And when you think of it that way, does that really help kids? And I never want to be held back uh, in what I do in my classroom because of maybe someone's not at the same place that I'm at. But understand this, that you might be excelling in some places as well and that are, you know, you're doing better than the colleague across the, the, the hall from you, but they're probably doing something better in your classroom as well, in their classroom that you need, you could learn from. And so we have to, first of all, look at when we're holding each other accountable, I uh, recognizing the strengths of the person across the hallway. What are some of the great things that they're doing? What can we learn from them? And how do we actually develop this and seeing how we improve what we do in the classroom. And one example of something I saw that was really powerful about, you know, classrooms holding each other accountable, you know, lifting each other up is that there is a science class. I talked about this in in the innovators mindset. Uh, There is basically one science class uh, in one school and there's another high school science class in another school. And it was teaching the same content, same section of, I think it was biology and it might've been something else. But that's not the point. The point was they use a hashtag uh, in their classroom and they shared it between the two classrooms. So in one classroom, they'd be doing working on something and they would share the hashtag and the other class would be like, hey, why are we not doing that? And the teacher would be like, we should be doing that. And then they would elevate their game and they get better. And then they would do something. The other class would be like, hey, we should be doing that. And they, all, they kept propping each other up. And I've talked about this idea of competitive collaboration. We talk a lot about the idea of competition being bad. And I don't think it is. And we've, we, you know, we've kind of like swung the pendulum to the other way where it's all about collaboration. The idea of competitive collaboration is that we push each other, but we also got each other's back that we support that you see across the hallway, something amazing going on. Can you go? And that might make you feel like I got to pick it up. Can you go across the hallway and actually say, hey, I saw you're doing this. Can you help me? And that's that idea of competitive collaboration. Actually, the push and support of one another, not just, you know, trying to, uh, you know, be so much better than the teacher across the hallway, but, you know, growing yourself and making sure that every kid can learn from your expertise, whether they're in your classroom or not. And so this is not something that necessarily, like, of course, the administrator should be a, a part of it. But if we see ourselves as accountable to one another, it's much easier to move forward as an organization than us only seeing or seeing ourselves as only accountable to one person in one specific position. And I think that's one of the ways that we can really create this culture of innovation. How do you both push and support the per, your colleagues, uh, one another? And this leads to the next one is that we have to promote and model Uh, having some of these challenging conversations and one of the things I do in my workshops is I encourage people to say hey uh, if there's anything that you disagree with and anything that I'm saying that uh, you don't like I encourage you to challenge me in this room okay what I don't want is at the end of the day you leave this space and you challenge me with your friends when I'm not present because that didn't help me and it didn't help each other or it doesn't help us you know because a lot of times some of my best work has come from someone pushing my ideas, pushing the things I'm, I'm sharing. And uh, a lot of times I'm seen as the expert coming into a school when I'm doing a workshop and I, I'm a learner. I'm someone who's trying to grow and, and I'm just trying to share my ideas. And uh, yeah, of course I have some expertise as does everyone listening here too. But if you are really an expert in anything, you know that the more expertise you develop in an area, the more you don't know, the more you can learn, the more that's out there. And so I always want to get better. So I think when we talk about those challenging conversations and sometimes when I see like, oh, we have to have challenging conversations, I'm seeing this from people who are not challenging ideas. They're just going at people. And that to me, I, I'm not really interested in that. I'm not, I'm not interested in like attacking someone and going after their character and things like this. I'm talking about when we challenge each other's ideas. And here's like a little tip that I'll share with you uh, to kind of identify uh, if, if someone's, Really, it's, it's not about the ideas. It's about the personal, you know, challenge. And here's a tip. Uh, a lot of times when people are challenging me, I, I, I try my uh, best Stephen Covey and I seek first to understand before being understood. So I start asking questions. I start trying to figure, okay, where is this coming from? Like, what am I missing? Uh, how can I 
connect some of the, our ideas together. And so what I'll do sometimes is uh, I'll listen to what they say and say, hey, I totally agree with you on this is a great, I, that's such a great point, that's so important. And I actually find in that conversation the place that we can actually bridge, the place that we can connect. And what I'll, I can tell you is that if that person then disagrees with what I just agreed with them on, it's not about your ideas. They just don't like you. They just have an issue with you. And that's the problem, right? And this is what I'll tell you. Once you figure that out, move on to the 95, 98, 99% of people who don't have an issue with you, who want to move forward. Because I'm not going to spend, you know, 95% of my time on the one person that, you know, maybe doesn't like me for whatever reason. I'm here to do what I can to help kids, to help my staff, to help my colleagues. And so, yeah, of course we want to have challenging conversations, but as long as we keep those, those challenges really on the ideas and not, it's not a personal thing, it's not an ego thing, uh, we can always get better. I think that's a really important uh, thing for me. The next point I share in this article is the idea that we constantly look at environments with fresh eyes. And here's an example of this. Uh, when you go into a school or a classroom, and let's say you've been there for 10, 15, 20 years, you probably become numb to some of the things that are on the walls. And I remember um, one of the things that's really beneficial about my job, I go into new schools all the time. I go into new spaces all the time. And I tend to notice things um, that people don't even notice. And I remember one time I was actually in a, a high school and there was this large, uh, really beautiful picture and there was a crack right down the middle of the picture. And it, it took away. And I actually asked, hey, hey, does anyone ever like talked about like fixing that crack? And the teachers I talked to said, I didn't even know that was there. I didn't even see it. It was literally one of the first things I noticed. And when you look at some of those things that I, that I see, you know, it, it made me feel like, hey, we are so numb to some things, but some kids are like, hey, you know, people don't really even care about the school. So they tend to maybe litter. They tend to not care about things. Uh, and little things like that. And so when you go into your classroom every day, when you go into your school every day, picture yourself being there for the first time and look at things. Uh, when school I went to, they were always about empowering the kids. You know, uh, kids can change the world. Kids can do all these things. And I would walk in with some of the, uh, you know, the learning specialist team into one school and their message was all about empowerment. And I counted how many times we got to the second door. So there's like one door as you entered, you go through another door and I would go every morning. I'd say, no, 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 don't, no, no. And it was like written no or don't like seven to 10 times on the door. So you can change the world, but don't do this. 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 And it was just all over the place. And I remember seeing that and thinking, you know, I remember one time it was elementary school and, uh, there was like a, it was like a K4 school and they had like a no smoking sign, you know? And I'm like, I'm like, are grade three kids lighting up in the middle of school? Is that, is that a thing that's happening here? Right. Do we have to tell them to, to not smoke? And I, you know, I understand the intent. I understand the intent. You know, we don't want kids to, to make bad choices. Uh, probably a lot of those signs that have popped up in our schools that say no or don't are someone really mad one day and just fed up. And then they put that sign up. And so when you look at that with fresh eyes, like how many times do you say no or don't when kids are into the classrooms? Uh, how many times do you say that? Do you tell kids you can change the world, but you know, don't bring food into the auditorium, like li little things like this. And I think we have to kind of frame our messages on like, what can we do? What are the possibilities? And the, the one thing I wrote about, I think this is an innovative of the box is that it's really hard to visualize don't. So if I say to you, don't talk, do you visualize closing your mouth or do you visualize, you know, talking, right? Don't, don't, don't sit down. Do you visualize standing? And it, it was kind of interesting. There's research on this and I, I can't, I don't remember off the top of my head, but like, do we actually encourage kids to do the thing that we say not to do by having them visualize that uh, in their heads? Like don't bully is sometimes putting bullying ideas into the heads of our students. So when you walk into your classrooms, when you walk in your school is when you read the piece of literature in your classroom, you might have been teaching that same piece for 15, 20 years, but pretend it's your first day and pretend and think about the perspective. And at one point it might've been really powerful. There might've been something really great. Um, but 
is it still relevant to this day? Is it still connected? So look at everything with fresh eyes. And I, I feel that really helps me. And, it, and it, you might really like, hey, this was here 25 years ago. It is still as powerful and as relevant today. And that's awesome. But if you sometimes don't even notice the things on the wall, I understand your kids are probably new there. They probably haven't spent, you know, some of our schools. Our, that's, our kids are there for, you know, one or two days when I've been there for 25 years. Fresh eyes will really help you see through the lens of the people entering your school and what message does it actually tell. And so the last one I share in this article is the idea of focusing on being a school teacher, not a classroom teacher. And I, I've gotten some pushback on this. And uh, when I explain the terms, hopefully people understand why I think this is such an important element. And uh, when you talk about this idea of a classroom teacher for me uh, and why I equated these or talked about these two different terminologies and you, you can call them whatever you want. But when I saw a classroom teacher, I'd see sometimes I, I kind of have this perspective of like someone in their classroom, great with their content, love their students. They would go out of their classroom and send kids to the office right away that weren't in the classroom. They didn't know them. So like, you're not my problem, right? The idea of a school teacher they can be great with their kids, great with their content. They walk out of the school. They see every kid in that school as their kid. And I'll tell you from my perspective, one of my shifts, kind of thinking about this. Uh, I remember when I was probably my third or fourth year as teaching, I hated supervision. I just absolutely despised it, right? I'm exhausted as a teacher and, you know, uh, that's a, sometime I just needed that break and then I didn't have it and then I have to watch kids I don't know. And I remember my principal at the time came up to me and said, look, I, I can tell you hate this. I can tell they hate doing supervision. You seem really cranky when you're out here. But if you saw this as an opportunity to connect with kids that you don't teach, you'll actually have a much more enjoyable time. It will be so much better of an experience for you. And you'll actually not only, it won't only be tolerable, it'll be something you enjoy. And, you know, there's, there's times in my life where I have these conversations, these one-off conversations where I was like, oh, that's, like a, that's like a really good point. And it changes me. And I started then seeing supervision as an opportunity. And I actually really enjoyed it. I liked having conversations in the hallways. And that's something that, you know, I, I continue on as an assistant principal, as a principal, you know, from my days as a teacher, from that one conversation, um, from that principal. And... Uh, that principal I've had, you know, principals that like, he was great, but, and I've had principals that were better and it shows you can learn from anybody, no matter, you know, what their level of efficiency is, things like this. If you're looking for that learning, looking to grow, and I'm sure there's people, uh, there's better podcasts, there's better this too, but you create your own learning. But I remember that, that shift for me that day when I thought about this idea of, supervision as an opportunity to connect with kids as opposed to just you know a, a pain in my day and I started to see students as you know the, the the school as a whole and then I started to realize that you know what I do in the hallway actually helps the teacher across the hall you know across the way that you know with the, the kid that I don't teach that if I get that kid smiling you know as a teacher it makes the the teacher across the hallway have a much easier time when the student enters the classroom and connecting and, and, and thinking about that and how powerful this is. And so we always say it takes a village, right? But do we see every kid as ours? I, I taught when I first started teaching, I was in a kindergarten to grade eight school and I would teach the you know lower elementary grades. And I love connecting with the, you know, the older students and um, it made everyone's life easier. And, and really thinking about that impact and so like, how does that have to do with, you know, building a culture of innovation? Because innovation starts with the relationships. It starts with, you know, helping people um, grow in the work that they do every single day. It starts with, you know, helping our kids be the best version of themselves. And one of the best examples I've ever, um, ever had heard about, a, 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 you know, this idea of school teacher. Uh, I was listening to a student who was struggling in school. And she had shared that she had struggled her entire high school. And she actually shared that she had suicidal tendencies. And she struggled with this. And I'll never forget this. And thanks to Jeter Raymer for introducing me to the student, creating this opportunity where um, students were sharing their their thoughts, their stories with administrators in West Dallas, Milwaukee, uh, in, that, in that school district. Uh, the student shared that she struggled with depression, with suicidal tendencies. And the thing that kept her going every single day 
was a teacher who had never taught her one day in that high school who every single morning greeted her and said and, and, and addressed her by her name. And she said that teacher, you know, gave me something. And it shows you that every interaction that you have can help a kid. And think about um, that interaction, how that went into the classroom, how that helped that, that teacher in that classroom teaching that student uh, because of that, the teacher in the hallway who never taught that kid helping that student get through that day to help them, you know, see themselves as valued and how that helps a student. And then you talk about the innovation. If you, I'm not going to be innovative if I don't want to be there. I'm not going to be innovative if I, um, you know, don't feel valued, don't feel cared about. And we all do that together. So I think that's something that's a really powerful example is something that always had stuck with me. And so when we talk about this idea of like building innovation, innovative organizations, it's not about, being the latest and greatest using all the new technology. It's just about finding new and better ways uh, to serve not only our students, but one another. And so if we only count on one person to do this, then it's never going to be effective. But if we actually look at how we hold each other accountable, how we serve one another, how we support each other while pushing them, uh, it's going to happen a lot quicker. When we do this together, um, it, it will happen in a much better way than depending upon an administrator, a uh, principal. Of course, they got to be a part of that, but it's something that we do together. Uh, thank you for taking the time to listen. I hope you enjoy these solo podcasts. I'd love to um, hear your comments, your thoughts. So if you want to share them in the in YouTube down below uh, or tweet to me at GCaroz, connect with me on Instagram and share some of your thoughts. I, I'd love to hear from you uh, if you made it this far, but thank you so much for taking the time to listen. I hope you have a wonderful day, and thank you so much for all that you do for education. Take care.